think I got it. Yeah. Hi there, I'm Lori Silverstein from Digital Divide Data. I'm here to share with you a very cool project that we're, we are about to undertake called Catholic Collaborative and Crowdfunded. And it's really been a very different approach to newspaper digitization than I've ever worked on. Um, the CRRA, the um, Catholic Research Resource um, Association, um, really was looking for a way to aggregate and digitize all Catholic newspapers, um, about a million and a half pages, from papers all over the U.S. Um, and you say, like, why all these Catholic newspapers? Scholars have cited that Catholic papers are a great source of relevant information for immigration, uh, research, education, medical, and different types of historical information on local communities. But they're very difficult papers to find. What they found is many of these are not digitized. Um, they're in little archives. They're sitting in a church basement in filing cabinets. And you can't even find them on big databases like WorldCat. Um, the, um, Chronicling America has about 40% of them. So this has been a really challenging issue for them. Um, they had no real funding, and the CRRA is really two full-time people and a lot of great volunteers from all over the country. So they looked for how can they fund this kind of a project, and they found Reveal Digital, which offers a crowdfunding type of mechanism to do this type of work. So how they've gone about this is, I'm from Digital Divide Data. We did worked with them on the specs, which basically follow the NDNP spec, and are doing all of the data conversion in Cambodia and Laos and our delivery centers there. DL Consulting, which has the Viridian platform, is going to be hosting this. Master Enterprises will be doing all of the scanning. And then Reveal will be working with um, CRRA on the cost recovery. So it's been a year of planning to get this kicked off. And it really is a global project. Uh, CRRA is based at Notre Dame. Um, I'm in Columbus, Ohio. DDD is in Cambodia and Laos. DL Consulting in New Zealand and Reveal in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So Reveal's been around since 2013. They launched their first open access uh, project called Independent Voices, which is all sorts of um, alternative newspapers. And they've had libraries contribute about $1.2 million towards digitization of alternative press. So we've worked with all of the companies together to come up with the project costs for archiving, admin, outreach, um, to really illustrate all the different components. And CRRA said they are happy to share this with anybody who is interested in how the investment came about. Um, they looked at different funding levels for the different types of libraries, academic versus non-academic libraries, and are now in the outreach um, section of getting this project going. We are starting a pilot next month. They have done outreach to all of the member institutions and then we'll be working with Reveal to market to libraries because this will all be open access. So the long-term term strategy for success is a longer-term archiving um, type of platform and pulling in more libraries that are interested in this type of content. Um, so this is going to be presented at a big Catholic uh, conference next month, and they're really going to be upping all of the requests for donations and, and work the project from there. And did I make it in three minutes? All right. There are any questions? Thank you. And how do I make it go? Those arrows or the arrows? Oh, okay. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm John Mignot. I'm the technology specialist for the Empire State Digital Network. And uh, I'm talk going to talk about a tool we built, um, <coughs> which has an unfortunate name. 
Um, but uh, first, I wanted to just talk a little bit about ESDN. We're the New York State Service Hub. Uh, we were established in 2013, and we basically serve the nine regional New York State Library Council members. Um, so we like to think of ourselves as a second generation hub in that when we came on, we're a pure aggregator. We don't host, a lot of the early DPLA hubs actually did host content, but we, we're not a portal. We don't host anything. We don't have anything that the public can go to. And basically all we do is we harvest metadata from via OAI from our partners and we send and we expose that metadata to DPLA. So we use Repox like a number of the, the second generation hubs. And Repox, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, it has almost no reporting capabilities whatsoever. Um, and we were getting a lot of requests from the Empire State Library Network, which is the coalition of the, the nine regional hubs. They wanted statistics on collections, um, you know, how many, of, how many records each of their providers had. Uh, you know, per collection. So uh, we were getting that we needed to provide some of this data to them and part of the problem was that this was early on when we really didn't yet have anything in DPLA. Uh, so as a result, the only possible data we had to report on these things uh, was via Repox. So we decided to write a tool. And we'd been looking for, uh, our, our executive director had been very enthusiastic about Jekyll as a tool. Uh, so we were sort of looking around for a project to, to use that, to use Jekyll with. And so I thought I could write this sort of very basic reporting and collections tool per council, for each council. So the calls tool, which had I thought about the name for five more seconds, I would have changed to call tool. Uh, and the other problem, yeah, I like, I, I, I was at the office and I said, look, I wrote this thing and they were like, did you look at the name? <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> but at that point, uh, I didn't feel like I could change it. Um, so, and Jekyll turns out to not be a great tool for this, uh, just because it's really meant for like outputting sort of, you know, it's the, the engine that drives GitHub pages. Uh, and it's really not meant for like sort of data crunching. And the numbers we were getting were actually not completely accurate. It was an extremely manual process. And uh, I had to like basically when I did, when I actually pulled data out of Repox, I had to spend an inordinate amount of time like actually editing, editing data files by hand. So our workflow was we would just grab everything out of Repox then uh, I wrote an incredibly complex and horrific style sheet that um, basically transformed that XML into XML that sort of fit into the data model and the tool. Uh, I then transformed that to JSON, and then that had to be transformed to YAML. And then we put the YAML into the Jekyll data directory, and I got sick of doing this by about the third time that I actually did it. Um, this is what it actually looked like. Uh, we had problems uh, in getting the numbers completely accurate just because of some quirks in the way Repox like outputs things and because of sort of some of the data problems we had. Uh, but this is sort of a, gives you the basic idea of what it looks like. Um, it, this is the council view. There's also, as you can see, there's, there's a provider view, which I didn't actually do a screenshot for. Um, and it just wasn't sustainable because there were too many steps to repopulate it. Uh, the only way we could really, um, you know, I would actually have to do, I would actually have to basically harvest the entire repository, which usually took about half an hour to 45 minutes. Uh, and then, re which resulted in like, I believe, something like a half gig XML file, which every editor I tried to load it into would complain mightily about it. Uh, even Emacs, which is pretty surprising. And, um, it just, it wasn't the right tool for this. It, it just wasn't. So what we learned from this is that we can't really use Repox to do uh, collection reporting. Uh, it's really only an aggregator. Uh, and Jekyll is not really meant for this. Uh, we currently, we've just begun sort of development on a state search portal 
uh, for New York State that we're hoping will actually consume DPLA API data and then um, use that to, to provide a search interface to our materials in DPLA. And actually, but on the other hand, you know, if you really feel like you need to like look at some horrible things, uh, it's both um, the repo is up and it's available and the tool itself is actually running at that URL. It's one of our GitHub pages. So that's it. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Dina, I'm the Innovation Hub Coordinator here at the Archive, so I'm going to give you my really brief five minute um, talk and encourage everybody to learn more about the Innovation Hub, box lunches can be picked up there, um, there's some hacking going on there, so get your lunches at the Innovation Hub and you can bother me for more questions and I can bother you about the Innovation Hub more. So. Um, I have been at NARA for just about, just over four years and in this role for about 14 months. Um, and so the Innovation Hub opened in July of 2015, so we've been open for just about nine months now. Um, and we're, we, um, our mission is to work on innovative ways to move the National Archives forward um, by collaborating with the public and with the staff at the National Archives. So we're sort of a cross between a maker space that you'd find in a public library and an innovation lab that you might find in a corporate setting. So uh, these, are, these are the three, four projects that we're sort of working on right now. Um, our biggest, sexiest project is the citizen scanning that we're doing. We're also working with Wikipedia, transcription, and the staff. Um, okay, so citizen scanning. We have a room dedicated, and this is our really big innovative idea, um, in order to meet our strategic goal here at the archives to make access happen and also connect with our customers. Um, and in order to make access happen, our goal, our big hairy goal is to uh, digitize everything in our collections. I think it's just over 1% right now that's digitized, something like that. Um, we are making a drop in the bucket. So since July of 20. 15 through the end of March, we have had um, close to 200 individual scanners come in. We have scanned uh, nearly 44,000 pages um, and over 2,100 individual files. The longest file that we have done is 384 pages. Um, these are done on flatbed scanners like you see here. Um, what we do is researchers can, for free, come in, use our scanners. Um, they can immediately take home a copy of the JPEGs. We have CDs. They can bring a flash drive. Um, they can hope to God that our internet works well enough that they can, you know, drop it into Dropbox. Um, these are big files. These are JPEGs. Um, so I don't think anybody's tried the Dropbox thing. Um, but we will then, they can take home the copy of the JPEGs. We then upload a copy into our catalog um, and give the person credit. So it says co Im uh, images contributed by citizen scanner Dina Herbert or your name here. Um, and people are really excited about it. The genealogy community has been really eating this up. Um, we've gone, done some scanathons. Anybody who's interested this afternoon, if the sessions are boring, get a researcher card, come and scan. Um, we have War of 1812 uh, pension files, or excuse me, compiled military service records. 19th, uh, 18th century and 19th century first names are really fun. Um, and we have. Uh, the genealogists have been eating this up. They have, and they sort of the word permeated through their community. In March, we had close, uh, just under 8,000 pages scanned, uh, which is almost double the amount of what we've been doing in previous months. So come help us meet our goal in April if you're bored tonight, to this afternoon. Um, we are also collaborating with Wikipedia. We are a space to do edit-a-thons, hackathons like the one going on this afternoon. Um, we are working to get more of our records into Wikimedia Commons as a goal throughout the archives, and so this is another another sort of avenue that we're working on. So we can host transcribe-a-thons, uh, Wikipedia edit-a-thons like this one in our space. Um, we just had our first transcribe-a-thon last Friday where we did about 150 
transcriptions. Um, we are working with Latino Tech, a new startup group, a new startup group here in DC to empower young Latinos to get more involved in coding. We're actually going to have a GIF a thon um, on May 20th, so I keep keep your eyes out for that. Um, lots of different ways to connect with our records. We also have, so there's a snack table outside. Uh, snack, S-N-A-C, not like snacks, like goodies. Um, but they do have a lot of goodies going on, just not edible ones. Um, so we've hosted their meetings. We're working with staff in other ways to sort of think innovatively about how to connect with our customers, how to use our resources. Um, and so stop by, get your lunch, and uh, come innovate with us. Happy to answer questions later. I think I'm under time. Okay or at time, thanks. Good morning. So how often have you yourself asked, looked at a digital project and said, how do they build that? Well, we get asked that question a lot at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, and we really try hard to um, open up the processes that we use to build uh, all of our digital projects, including uh, open source software that we build. Um, for the Histories of the National Mall Project, which was a, a three-year National Endowment uh, for the Humanities uh, funded grant, we built um, a digital public history site um, that was intended to expose a lot of the real hidden history of the National Mall. Many of you have been, if you're not from D.C., or even if you are from D.C., have been wandering around the mall, um, and there's very little signage, even though there's a lot of construction. It didn't take away signs. There's very little um, interpretation on the mall, and my colleague Sharon Leon and I um, thought there was a real opportunity to build a project that incorpor incorporated historical map layers, um, personal stories, primary sources, um, inquiry questions that opened up some of this complex history. So as part of the grant, not only did we create this um, awesome mobile public history site, but we also created a guide that we're, we called Building Histories of the National Mall. And um, rather than publishing a very short, uh, a document that we only sent to our program officers. We decided that we would create a WordPress site for this, um, invest quite a bit of time in documenting all of our processes, and we put it in the same domain as the project. Um, if you're using Mall History, um, you know, the History's a National Mall site, you won't stumble upon this most likely, but we wanted to at least create it um, within the same domain. And we also um, have published it under a Creative Commons license, uh, CCBYNC, to encourage its use and distribution for non-commercial purposes. Um, and we also tried to make visible um, that this was a collaborative project. And so you'll notice that this is a collaboratively written document. Um, it contains uh, voices of our uh, web developers, our web designers, um, graduate students, um, our outreach coordinators, and they get to share in their own voice um, the process, what they did, but also how it contributed to the much larger project. Um, and we opened up the entire process. So we um, talk about content research and planning and about paper prototyping for testing before we built anything um, in Omeka. And then we also included examples of the designs that we did not choose. So this is an example of a mood board that we did not select. You can also see logos we didn't choose. So, um, but a lot of that, again, was to open up and show that this is this was not built um, very quickly, that it took a very intentional um, and iterative process. We also share some of the challenges and successes, um, uh, some of the lessons learned we, that we face throughout the project. Um, you know, specifically, I mentioned even signage. It's difficult. Um, in fact, mostly impossible if you're not part of the Park Service to get signage on the mall that would encourage um, 
tourists to come and use the site. Uh, we did our best through coalitions of uh, you know, museums and visitor centers that surround the mall to um, distribute our brochures. Um, and also Wi-Fi, we, you know, uh, very, um, well, we, we were expecting that the Wi-Fi on the mall that had uh, DC public Wi-Fi and the Smithsonian Wi-Fi was going to increase um, and there would be boosters sort of all across the mall and they've, it's kind of remained stagnant. <laughs> so you're, you've tried to use the public Wi-Fi in the mall, you know what, it, what we mean, but that was also part of our accessibility. We wanted it to be accessible to international visitors who wouldn't have data plans necessarily, but might have Wi-Fi enabled um, handheld devices. So we, um, for, and also for organizations that are in the early planning stages of projects, we wanted to make this document open and available um, and also provide a, a model for building um, a cost-effective solution for delivering mobile content. So building histories of the National Mall is part of a, a long legacy at the center for um, encouraging history, humanities, cultural heritage professionals to be active participants um, and builders of their own digital projects and also for making these processes as transparent as possible. So we encourage you all to do the same. And if you are going to the mall today, don't forget to bring your sunscreen, which I have available if anybody needs it. <laughs> Thank you. There's only one side. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. My name is Patrick Murray John. I'm a developer at Org Rosenzweig, Center for History and New Media. And for once in a presentation, I am not going to speak about Omeka. Yeah. This is new and amazing for me. Uh, instead, I'm going to speak about something that I worked on in the uh, role that I had for the last year as one of DPLA's community reps. I am outgoing this year. It's been a fun time. Are there any community reps here? Yes, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to say a little bit about a site that a fellow rep, uh, Christina Harlow, and I built uh, for Ada Lovelace Day, we had a great notion that combining the resources and the APIs and the creativity that's there in DPLA with Ada Lovelace Day would be a great combination. Ada Lovelace Day, of course, is a sort of day, a rallying point for encouraging women in uh, STEM fields, science and technology, uh, engineering, math, and anything sort of digital. Late one night uh, last year, this, this spring to me somehow, response on Twitter was great. Christina jumped right in and we said, okay, we can do this, we can build this. So we built DPL A, Ada Lovelace Day. There is the URL and Christina did a wonderful, amazing job uh, putting together ideas for logistics and templates. The idea being this wouldn't have to be just at one place. This could be distributed like all across the country. Get people using DPLA for Ada Lovelace Day. This was going to be fantastic. It was going to be super exciting. And the one I organized only had two people sign up. So this is also a tale of, yeah, sometimes things don't work out. But I still think this is a good idea. I still think this has legs. I still think it could be useful. And so all of the material that we put together in the site, we're just going to keep up there and with the hopes that um, some one of you, perhaps one of the new community reps, will be interested in sort of picking this up. I'll keep the domain going. Re 
Okay, so we missed each other. <laughs> okay, so let's combine forces. Um, it's there, it's available. I'm not sure that I will be able to like organize one of these events myself this year, but I'll keep the site up and uh, go to the site, uh, talk about putting together an event, tweet me, send me an email if uh, you want to help pick this up. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm uh, Raf Viglianti uh, from the University of Maryland, uh, and I want to talk about this um, NEH-funded digital humanities startup project called Enhancing Music Notation and Traceability. Um, this project is now uh, concluded, and I just want to give you an overview of the specification that we created for addressing encoded music on the web. Uh, what I mean by addressing music notation? Uh, I mean being able to uh, refer and talk about, so more generally address, a specific portion of music notation. Uh, this is something that sort of happens all the time. Uh, for example, these are two uh, concluding measures from a Mozart piano sonata, and I might point to that note to make certain kinds of statements. I could make some analytical statements, like saying, oh, it's a tonic node, note, uh, or uh, it's the final chord of an authentic cadence, or I could make some more casual comment or a notation by saying that it's actually not the hardest note to play in the piece, or something like that. And while you know, I can do this by pointing to a node in a physical score, there isn't really a way of, doing, of modeling this kind of addressing act uh, when I have a digital score. How do I refer specifically to that part of the music notation? So we came up with a system for it, uh, and we structured it as a URI so that it can be used to um, target resources on the web. Uh, and it's made uh, of five parts, the first one being a document ID that can be a URL identifying uh, an encoded music file, um, then followed by a number of measures that I want to talk about. Uh, and within those, I can choose uh, um, which staves I'm interested in, which more or less corresponds to which instruments I want to talk about. And within that, then I can be very precise and choose exactly which beats I want to address, which allows for a good level of granularity. And I can also specify some options to uh, uh, indicate what kind of document I want to get back. And uh, if you're curious and you find this useful, uh, the full API is specified at that address. And I can also show it to you later if you, if you find me. Uh, to give a practical example, um, these are uh, a few measures from um, a Bach uh, Trio Sonata. Uh, and here, for example, I want to talk about the fact that the, there is a sort of repeating pattern. You can, even if you don't read music notation, you can kind of figure out that in the three highlighted parts, there is. They, they look very similar. Um, so to indicate this, I'm going to say, oh, I'm going to talk about an area that spans from measure six to measure eight. You can see there's a five there. That means that's the first measure is, a, is, is the fifth, and then six, seven, and eight. And specifically in measure six, I want to talk about the second staff. In measure seven, I want to talk about the first staff. And in measure eight, I want to talk about the third staff. So that's why the staves are indicated as two and three. And then I can be very specific about which beats I want. For example, here I want to leave out the first beat because uh, it's, it doesn't repeat in the same way in all three parts. So I actually say that I want a little bit after the beginning of the first beat to the end of the measure. Um, why do I think this is useful? Um, so it can be applied to a number of uh, scenarios, uh, I think. Uh, so first of all, let's imagine, since we're talking about digital libraries, let's imagine that there is a collection of uh, encoded files uh, of music notation that are stored by a digital library or some sort or some other digital archive. Um, using this kind of reference um, system, I, I, may, I might be able to um, to use and talk about and annotate these documents. Uh, as, and the only requirement that they have is that they exist on the web. 
Uh, and once I'm, I've made a, a, an assertion of some kind, I can then uh, associate some sort of analytical statement, like I've been doing in these examples, or I can retrieve the notation that I'm interested in and pass it on to uh, another process for an automatic analysis of some sort, for example, or I might be interested in rendering just one page of a huge music score, and this allows me to just go and retrieve the notation I'm interested in. Uh, to test this out, we partnered, partnered with a Digital Duchemin project that is a, an archive of um, Renaissance chansons that were um, annotated by a bunch of students working on the projects and they created, populated a database where they wrote some annotations uh, about some music notation in certain measures. And we remodeled this data um, using the, uh, this sort of music addressability API to specify the uh, addressing acts to the music notation, which allowed us to remodel this as a linked open data set, which I would argue made it a bit more useful than a closed database. Um, so the specification that I show you is completely format independent uh, because it, it's able to talk about music notation using primitives that are generally represented by every music notation system, such as measures, staves, and beats. Uh, but once you want to implement this, you need to be able to work with specific formats. It's not very different from image servers where uh, you can request a specific region um, and a certain zoom level, but then the image server knows how to work with JPEG 2000 or TIFF, etc. Uh, in this specific case, I created an implementation for MEI, that's the Music Encoding Initiative format. Uh, and basically, all of this tool does, called OMAS, takes an EMA expression with an MEI file, goes and retrieves it, and slices it, and gives you back the music notation that, that, that you requested. Uh, so this was the end of the project, but we're continuing work um, with a, in, in, together with this project called Citations, the Renaissance Imitation Mass, where a bunch of scholars are working on these uh, masses, so music for mass from the Renaissance that um, are, um, quote each other a lot. So they're identifying all the cross-references and they're modeling the references using the, uh, EMA, the, the music um, addressability specification that I showed you. And to make it a little bit easier for them, I've been working now on a tool that renders some uh, music notation and allows them to just click on the notes or select an area and that will build the expression so that then they can use it to model the data. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I apologize for my voice or lack thereof. Um, so hopefully we can um, get through this. Um, my name is Marianne James Daly. I am the manager of the labs at DC Public Library, which encompasses a number of spaces, including a makerspace, uh, AV Studio Lab, um, and also our newest lab is the Memory Lab, which is what I'll talk about today. Um, the Memory Lab is our public uh, digital preservation space um, and it is all about bringing that um, to the public and making it more accessible to your regular just Joe off the street. So what is the Memory Lab? Um, <clears throat> it is a DIY style space um, in our digital commons which is our large public access computer space um, in at our central library here in DC. Um, and we have a number of, um, we have equipment there for digitizing home movies, audio, slides, uh, photographs, um, all sorts of media that are obsolete or possibly soon to be obsolete. Um, and we provide step-by-step -step instructions. Um, we have a lib guide that has details on how to use all of the um, equipment in the memory lab. But we stress that it's a DIY space. Um, the patrons who come in to use it uh, they control the process from start to finish. We're there to consult, but it is really all their process. So it was started in June 2015. The brains behind these lab were um, Jamie Mears, who was with us for about a year. She's almost done um, as our NDSR fellow, um, National Digital Stewardship Fellow with um, Library of Congress and IMLS. And also Lauren Algie, which who is our amazing Special Collections Digital Librarian, and she originally conceived of this idea and put forth this suggestion to have this fellowship, to have a fellow come work on this project. And Nick Karelchuk, who is our technology and innovation manager. 
Uh, one of the, uh, the inspiration, or pretty much the only analog that we could find in a public library, um, is at Vancouver Public Library, and they have an inspiration lab, which is focused on creation and um, manipulation of digital tools, I mean, of digital, um, digital media. And so they have a DIY space with eight stations, which includes image scanners, a VHS conversion station. They have an eight millimeter digital eight analog video station, which we don't have, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and they also have an audio tape to digital conversion station. Um, and like I said, the overall goal of the Inspiration Lab is a focus on creation, which we decided we would do something different. Um, right there is one of my employees. That's Drew over there. Um, as part of our process of getting ready to open this lab, we had staff bring in their own personal materials to digitize and just see what's going on. Um, he decided to digitize his audio tapes from college, his mixtapes, and I think that one right there was a library mixtape, which I thought was pretty, pretty cool. Um, so um, as ours differed from Vancouver in that we have one station that's a one-stop shop. So it depends on what you want to use, what you want to convert that day. Um, you plug in the appropriate um, equipment and you get running. Our also different from Vancouver, we wanted to make preservation a focus. I think one of the things that um, is interesting and um, we've seen this in talking to patrons is communicating the idea that, um, that your personal effects are important. Um, that not only it's not just for you, but it can also have historical significance um, and carry on past even the life of where you are or um, who your ancestors are. Um, and we also wanted to kind of address the question of how can we give patrons the freedom to create um, while also ensuring that our seed material is preserved. So you have a Betamax tape of your Christmas, open air presents at Christmas, um, or you have um, some old photos of um, a just family on vacation somewhere, um, yeah, you can digitize that stuff, but how do you make sure you preserve it and digitize it in a way that ensures that it has longevity and can go forward? So um, after months of researching, testing, and planning mainly by Jamie, um, and she has detailed this a lot on her blog, which I believe is jamiemears.wordpress.com. I should have put that on here, but oh well. Um, after much of research, testing, and planning, we opened this in February 2016, so it has not been open that long yet. Um, and we also tied a Black History Month programming. So on the day that we opened, we also had a screening of a documentary film called From a Lens Darkly, where it discussed the importance of um, um, the significance of black photography and of family photography and um, the director whose name is escaping me right now unfortunately and is amazing. Um, he has a road show where he travels the country and has people share their photographs and artifacts from their families to kind of communicate also as we are trying to communicate that importance of digitizing and sharing the stories in your photography, your videos, and your audio. All right, so how's it gone so far? Um, we've had more than 95 memory lab reservations since the launch. That's 474 hours of digitizing. We um, have an online reservation space, so you can reserve time for three and three hour blocks. Um, and it's been, we allow um, up to a month ahead of booking. Um, we are consistently booked a month ahead. We have people come up and say, hey, I can't book. You know, when is it opening up? And we're like, it's, it's, it's coming, just watch the space. Um, we've had 61 attendees for memory lab drop-ins. So like I said, it's very DIY. You can just go online and reserve time in the memory lab. But um, some people don't feel comfortable or feel a little scary just jumping in. So we have some drop-in classes where people can say, hey, I'm going to convert my VHS tape. And we can kind of quickly run through the process with them. Um, and we've had more than 50 staff trained in personal digital archiving best practices. That includes my 12 to 13 staff who are in the labs and also librarians, library staff who are at our other 25 locations at DC Public Library. Um, and through that training, they are also developing classes and events at their locations um, to further the idea of personal digital archiving. All right, well, we learned. They like us. They really like us. As I said, um, it is immensely popular. We thought it was going to be popular. Um, also, just feedback from Vancouver, it seems popular there as well. But I think we did not anticipate the true magnitude of um, the need and desire um, to do this. 
Uh, we also have seen that VHS and slide digitation are the most popular, so as we move forward, it's kind of having that question of um, what does that mean and how, does, how do we go from there. Um, and then also it attracts a dynamic range of users and poses a learning experience for all ages. So um, I say, hello computers, hello obsolescence. One thing that's really interesting is that um, we have um, retirees that usually come in the mornings and want to scan their stuff um, or dig digitize whatever they have. Um, and they are very comfortable with, um, with the VHS. They are very comfortable with the cassette players, but they are very reticent, kind of scared to touch the Mac and play with the computer. Um, on the other end, we have kind of more young professionals who come in in the evenings to digitize their stuff. And of the other way, they are very comfortable with the Mac, like let's go, comfortable with a scanner. But if they have to touch a Betamax player, they're kind of like, I don't know what to do with this. I'm afraid I'm gonna break something. Um, and I think that also kind of carries throughout the labs as a whole is that it's that whole idea of, um, of being comfortable with touching something that's unfamiliar and getting past that point of the unfamiliar and getting to the point of creating and making. Um, and lastly, what we've also learned is document, document, document. We have to document um, everything that's going on, not only in the wiki um, that we have as a reference for patrons and we get feedback from them as well as like, is the wiki helpful for you to just jump in and digitize? But also um, from a staff end, um, how we, um, we just have um, diagrams on how you set up the space for the different patrons. Um, what are the problems that we run into when customers come in um, to also just what are the day-to-day -day operations for setting up that space? Um, and okay, what are the challenges? What does real-time capture really mean? I think something that is really key, and I think a lot of you guys are familiar with this too, is that it's actually real-time capture. I think um, in our kind of instant gratification world, people think, oh, I'll just pop my tape in and bam, it'll magically be transferred into a digital format. It's five minutes and I can go about my day and do a haircut or whatever. No, obviously it's not that way. If you have a 60 minute VHS tape of your child's recital, it's gonna take 60 minutes to digitize that. Um, so really kind of communicating that and say, you're really here for the long haul. And I think that's also why we structured it in three hour blocks to give people time to be able to really have a significant experience. Um, one thing that we thought we would have a problem with is people understanding how much space is, like how much space is a gig, how much space you need um, to save your uh, materials. Um, what we actually are having a problem is actually saving it onto that material. Um, so that's something that we didn't know until, um, until we started. Um, also, um, and we kind of thought this was gonna happen, but it was confirmed when we started. DIY does not mean that completely hands off on staff involvement. Depending on who's there that day, it could be five minutes of like, here's all the things that are here, go at it. Or it could be someone who definitely needs more hand holding. And since we're really trying to push the DIY model, it's testing out how do we communicate this in all mediums possible so that people can feel comfortable doing that. Um, sorry, oh my goodness, okay, I'm, I'm all right. Um, staff training never ends. We always have to have training. Um, you can't test everything, as I mentioned. Um, and as we go from here, we're gonna um, start some programming. We also have programs on archiving social media, digital estate pro planning, um, so that what happens after I die, not only just my um, photos in my photo album, but also my Facebook and my social, and my Twitter, what happens to that. Um, and also preservation best practices, because again, we wanna make sure that people save these things in the best possible way for the best longevity. Um, and just how this can be sustainable, because we are transferring this over from a fellow who pretty much created this to something that is going on, hopefully for the longevity of the public library, um, and how we transfer this, um, and how special collections benefit. So one thing that I was mentioning before is having people have an awareness of their stuff is important, is that tying in with special collections. We have a punk, we have a DC punk archive noting, hey, are you digitizing your tapes from a basement show in 1992? Hey, we may be able to use this. Um, and also how it can spread to other libraries. If you check out the wiki, we have a guide on how other libraries can duplicate this. And even in the short time that it's been open to the public, we've had requests from other public libraries on how they can duplicate it where they are. Um, and I went over, but thank you very much.
Okay, so yes, I can do this in three minutes. She just asked. So this is, um, my name is Stephen Robertson. I'm from the Roy Ravensburg Centre for History and New Media out at George Mason. I just want to quickly talk about a piece of software that we have in development at the moment, so don't go looking for it. You're not going to find it. Um, it's a piece of software we're building with support from the Mellon Foundation intended for researchers to make it possible for them to describe, edit, organise and share the photographs that they take in digital archives. Um, and the reality is the digital camera now is a fairly default piece of um, equipment that people take into the archive. They photograph mountains of photographs and then they end up with piles of images described as numbers by their cameras which they struggle to organise. And there is simply no piece of photographic software out there that really does what researchers need with their archival materials. So what we're building Tropy to do is to allow researchers to edit item metadata after they import their photographs into Tropy, and most importantly for most people to batch edit that metadata so that you can apply those descriptions to a whole bunch of photographs taken from the same collection at the same time. We're also building customised metadata templates that you can shape to particular collections and that you can pre-populate with the standard kind of citation data that you have, all designed to speed up and systematise the description of your records. We're going to put in some basic editing um, functionalities. This is not intended to be a Photoshop style photo editor, but it will let you do the basic things you do need to be able to do to read your images properly. So sharpen, crop, adjust the contrast, zoom them. It'll allow you to organise those photographs group them into documents, so multiple photographs of a multiple page document collected together as a single document, and also to build collections from documents. It'll also allow you to tag those photographs and then to search and browse all of your archival photographs, either in lists or by thumbnails. Um, in addition, we'll build in some basic opportunities to take notes on a photograph and to take notes on selected parts of a photograph um, if you're working with particular kinds of non-text-based documents um, is what we're thinking about for that case. Importantly, as always, you need to be able to get it out of Tropy as well as into it. Um, Tropy will give you the capacity to export both the images and the metadata in a separate machine-readable file. And we're building some initial plugins to allow you to transmit to external services. To Flickr, to our very own Omeka, and to a digital asset management system to be named later in consultation with some of the institutions we're talking to. Um, one of the things that we're really hoping that Tropy will do, in addition to being a tool for researchers, is to provide an opportunity for researchers to share the material that they're photographing with the archives and libraries in which they're working. Um, this is intended, therefore, obviously, as a platform that could spur crowdsourced digitisation. It could also be a source of user-generated metadata. And when we're creating those metadata templates, we're talking to institutions about building templates for their collections that would both produce more systematic metadata when researchers come to use those collections, but could also be the basis of user-generated metadata shared back with libraries and archives. And that's one of the reasons why I'd wanted to talk about Tropy here at DFPLA Fest, because this is a researcher first tool, but it's intended also to be a bridge between researchers and the collections, so that those thousands, if not tens of thousands of photographs that graphs that walk out of your reading rooms every week might actually come back and give you an opportunity to do something with it. Um, we're developing this software in Electron, initially building for Mac, Windows and Linux, and initially as a desktop piece of software though, down the road, our research shows clearly that there are more and more people taking these images on mobile devices, and so Tropy for mobile would be a further possible iteration, but we're starting with desktop. This is a project that I'm running with Sean Tackett um, at the Rosenzweig Centre, better known as the project head for Zotero, and we're drawing a lot on our experience with Zotero. Um, the developers are Syl Sylvester Keo and Johannes Kirk, who are both based in Vienna in Austria. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Tropy, email me or send me a tweet. Thank you.